Hello everyone and welcome to the first of two GOMA talks happening in conjunction with the current exhibition GOMA Q, Contemporary Queensland Art. I'm Sarah Konoski from ABC Radio National's Books and Arts program. What is Queensland identity in 2015? Does it define the culture that's made here? And how does our art reflect the changing character of this state? These are the kinds of questions we're going to be canvassing this hour. And given that, I think it's particularly important that we begin this conversation with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of this land on which we stand and acknowledge elders past and present. And it is wonderful to have a room full of Queenslanders, or at least honorary <laughs> Queenslanders, for this GOMA talks on who we are, who are we, defining a state. And we want your involvement. You can tweet comments and questions with the hashtag GOMATalks or SMS via 0488 Talks or hop on Facebook and we'll aim to respond to your comments as we go along. With me on the panel are Michael Zavros, whose work is featured in Goma Q. And Michael's exquisite realist paintings, photographs and sculptures have been exhibited in major museums here in Australia, in New Zealand, in Asia and in Europe. He's received numerous <laughs> awards, including the inaugural Bulgari Art Award and the Doug Moran National Portrait Prize. And it is his birthday today. <laughs> so I think that we just begin with applause for Michael Zappos. Thank you. <laughs> what better way to celebrate? Ben Law is a Queensland-born, now Sydney-based journalist, columnist and screenwriter. He's the author of The Family Law and Geisha Adventures in the Queer East. He's also the author of the book Shit Asian Mothers Say with his sister Michelle, and we should acknowledge that Ben's mother is in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> A television adaptation of The Family Law written by Ben will be screened on SBS next year. Michael Rayner is Principal Director of Cox Rayner Architects. That's a practice which has had a major design impact across Queensland. He's also Adjunct Professor in Architecture at the University of Queensland and at Griffith University. And he's been an important contributor to public policy on infrastructure and development in Brisbane. And finally, Lindy Hume, who's Artistic Director of Opera Queensland. That's a role she's had since 2012, following on from successful stints as festival director for Sydney Festival and Perth International Arts Festival. And she's in big demand as an opera director internationally. Please join me in welcoming our guests. <laughs> so let's begin by looking at the big picture relationship between where we live and the culture that we make. Ben, you moved to Sydney a few years ago. Do you think of yourself as a Sydney sider now? It's funny, when I moved there, I thought that's what happened, that you sort of adopt the identity of your new city. I've been there for two years, as you just said, and I actually find the opposite is true, at least for me, that I identify more as a Queenslander more than ever. And I mean, I'm, I'm 32, so I've spent, I spent 30 years growing up in, in Queensland. And there have been various points in my life, depending on where I've lived in Queensland, where I've almost wanted to disown that. You know, like I grew up on the Sunshine Coast for 17 years, and I always had a love-hate relationship with the third biggest municipality in Queensland. And, um, you know, and it's nothing against the Sunshine Coast, it's actually quite beautiful, but a lot of my friends were surfy, outdoorsy types, and for this acne-ridden, sort of clarinet playing homosexual wasn't really the most perfect <laughs> fit. Um, then I moved to Brisbane, and I, I, I still remember my first day in Brisbane, actually, moving well, what, here. What happened that So I was 17 day? years old, because we graduate earlier in this state, and uh, it just meant I couldn't drink for a long time while I was at university. And I was just walking through Queen Street Mall, and I thought, this is the most beautiful thing in the world. And, and for me, it was. It, it was freedom. I thought, the Brisbane River was fantastic. I thought, like for me, it was, and still is, a really big, fantastic city that really breathes and also, unlike a lot of other world cities as well, has pockets of natural feralness that I quite enjoy. And I don't mean feralness in necessarily a bad way, but when my friends would visit me from other states and cities um, in Brisbane, they're just like, this place is actually really wild. Mm. And I really enjoy that, especially coming back to Brisbane as well. So the obvious question is, why have you moved to Sydney? Oh, how much time have you got? <laughs> um, there are like a dozen really good reasons. And look, I really love Sydney. But to answer your original question, um, 
I do identify as a Queenslander who happens to be living in Sydney. Every time I see someone whip out that really ugly Suncorp Metway bank card that they've got, I don't know if any of you have it, it's a really ugly ATM card, I'm like, you're one of my people, you're one of my people. <laughs> and people, I think, connect as um, sort of the Queensland diaspora in Sydney. You can sort of hear something in their voice or you can hear a slight vulgarity in their sense of humour that locates them very quickly. Has the move changed what you write about or the way you write, do you think? Well, that's a good question. Well, it's funny because, as you mentioned before, I'm write, I've been writing a screenplay for the SBS adaptation for The Family Law. So my head's really been in a Queensland headspace because it's very much a Queensland story that I've been writing. And I think I can write about it more clearly being outside of it, actually, that I can understand what Queensland means to me now that I'm no longer living in it full time. Um, that I understand the beauty of what my childhood actually offered me and the strangeness as well. I think Queensland is a magnificent, strange landscape. Michael Rayner, you've made a big contribution to the way we experience this city through your architecture. Where will we have encountered your buildings, even if we're not aware of it? Mm, we were talking a bit before about hate mail, and this is where I come to say, this is what I do. <laughs> I, I was explaining um, b before to Sarah that I had to go under seven minutes of laser uh, treatment um, a, a few days ago, and, um, uh, and you have to stay very still with goggles over your head because the laser's pointing at you, where the, um, the nurse that was doing it proceeded to spend seven minutes criticising everything I'd, I'd ever done. Um, <laughs> and I and had no way out. the recommendation of, um, that, of that medical service um, later. So <laughs> this is where I say what we've done. Uh, Kurilpa Bridge um, is one of them, Goodwill Bridge, the ferry terminals um, that have just been completed along the river, other things that people know. My first building in Queensland was the Brisbane Convention Centre um, a long time ago, and then its expansion, um, Magistrates Court. Um, so there's a whole. You sort must of feel like almost things. a North Korean dictator. It's like you've designed <laughs> the entire city. <laughs> no, well, I, I did. I, as a cultural thing, I, I, I have a couple of a couple of boys, and um, when they were sort of five or six, this is very awkward for me, embarrassing to say, but you know, I used to drive around with them, of course, and say. Guess who did that building? <laughs> <laughs> Guess who did that one too? And at six years old, one of them was able to say, Dad, Dad, God's sake, stop. I know every building you've done. And I, you can't. What do you mean you can't? They're all different. Come on. And he said, they've all got green glass. And I went, oh, he's right. So <laughs> if you, if, another project we did was SW1, it, which is in Melbourne Street, if you know it's where Era Restaurant is um, down there. And if you have a look at it, that happened at that time, and that's got grey glass, all because of my son's comment. <laughs> Nothing to do with a client or anything else. It just couldn't be green. Are they distinctively Queensland structures? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, you look, I'd say, I, th I think on the whole, yes, but the reason I'd say that is not so much because of what they are, but I did, I've done the opposite. I've come from Sydney in 1990, having actually worked for 10 years down there. I really did find coming to Queensland, despite some um, sort of limitations about parochialism and, you know, I, I actually think, you know, kind of lack of adventure in some ways is what I experienced coming here in the 90s. Um, but I also found that there wasn't a kind of stylistic constraint, which actually I was a, only became aware of when I came to Brisbane, existed in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and an expectation that you'll keep up with a kind of school or something of architecture, and that wasn't here. So. I think the projects that we've done here are distinctly Queensland in the sense that they don't belong to anywhere else except Queensland. Beyond that, do they have features in common beyond the green glass? <laughs> um, yeah, look, I do think that. I, I think we've had a chance to be more exuberant and create more exuberant uh, things. So if I looked at Kurilpa Bridge, to give you an example, and actually thinking you know, about what pe people said about it afterwards, and it did make me think that's culturally very um, awareness creating for me. And if, um, to, for, so, for example, on the Goodwill Bridge, which we did, which is a more conservative thing, at that time, no one wanted a new bridge on, across the river. Everyone was suspicious about what its motives were. It was really for cars. Um, I made coffee at a community night one night after I'd finished the community talk, and a lady was there, and I said, would you like me to make a cup of coffee? And she said, oh, that'd be lovely. And so I go, made the coffee, and I gave her the coffee, and she said, oh, you're the architect, aren't you? And I said, oh, yes, thank you, I am. And she hurled the cup of coffee <laughs> straight down my, my oh shirt. My so that, that was 2000. Come 10 or 12 years later, a Kurilpa Bridge wasn't that same problem. 
Um, so we got to do a more exuberant bridge as a result of that. However, having said that, we then got these wonderful metaphors that came out later that I loved, which were uh, a giant um, de dead upside down spider. Um, <laughs> there were a couple of flattering ones like fishing trawlers, but the one I loved was um, it's a it's a bunch of old hills hoists for labour to hang out their dirty linen. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was kind of kind of beautiful. So um, it kind of sum, summed up. But I like to think we, we actually thought of it as a kind of frozen ballet. And um, whatever crazy sound that coming across to Goma, um, trying to get art to run out of the city and into the landscape of the city is what we were trying to do with it. Um, and there were a couple of other things too about an, an artist called Martin Boyce who actually then built the three sculptures that you see in the park there who um, talked about um, a collapsed landscape or um, a shipwreck and we sort of saw the bridge exactly the same way so some of the influence of what we did came from an artist um, and then we worked worked about that um, unfortunately that was the only <coughs> metaphor and I never heard anyone acknowledge but um, now you've made that public that, yes. I had no idea that architects attracted such violent protests oh, I know it's it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a great career they don't teach you it at uni that's dangerous sure. <laughs> dangerous job Michael Zavros you grew up on the Gold Coast has that affected your aesthetic uh, yeah I, I, it has to have I think you know we're, we're all as artists very much a product of the place that you know we grew up in um, the experiences we have, and th the Gold Coast is such an unusual place that, you know, I'd, as I got older on the Gold Coast, people I'd hear people say the, the Gold Coast was completely bereft of culture, but I, I, f I found it to be completely opposite, and it's such a, a, a strange and varied place that, that that I just loved. It was this kind of wilderness for me as a child, and it's it's like the theme parks that the Gold Coast has. I think the Gold Coast is is a theme park, you know. It's, mm. w I grew up um, in this suburb called Coomba when we had two acres, which I thought was, you know, 50 acres when I was when I was little, and we had horses and chickens, and, and I had this very bucolic, rural kind of kind of life, and I'd spend my days just riding my horses and drawing, and and yet 15 minutes away there were the golden beaches and and the the the, the city lights of Surface Paradise, and so it's this ever shifting um, landscape, I suppose, and. Um, and, and so much sort of happened on the Gold Coast at a time at the time when I was growing up. You know, Sanctuary Cove happened, and money happened on the Gold Coast, and these these huge injections of of um, well, I guess money. Um, mm. All those big designer stores opened on the Gold Coast even before Melbourne and Sydney, and you know we had Frank Sinatra and Whitney Houston come to Sanctuary Cove, and, and all <laughs> of these these amazing things happening in this this place out, outside of Brisbane, and. Um, it, it was it was an interesting place to, to grow up. It sort of makes sense in terms of your work, which is so fascinated by luxury and by glamour. Is that the Goldie bling in you coming um, out? Mm. A, a, a little bit, I think, but um, I, I don't know. I, I think that I was, um, I, I guess, obsessed with things that were happening away from the Gold Coast. I mean, my Gold Coast probably didn't see a, a lot of that. Um, and I think probably more like someone like Baz Luhrmann or, or Lee Barry, these figures that could only have come from these, these very remote country towns and, and obsess over something that is incredibly beautiful or European or, or glamorous or something. You become this slavish aesthete. Um, I, I think that m my Gold Coast experience was almost the, the, the opposite of that. Mm. Lindy, you direct opera across the globe. Do you think your work is shaped more by the performers that you're working with or where it's taking place? Um, everything's about context. Absolutely everything's about context. So um, I, I, I think probably I look to the audiences first rather than the artists first. Um, when I'm directing an opera, <coughs> a, a comedy for example, uh, in, in Australia, I have a sense of what, what the Australian sense of humour is, and I, and I go there. I was absolutely terrified last year to direct a, a comedy in, in Leipzig. <laughs> They're just, famous for their laughing in Leipzig. <laughs> <laughs> and I had absolutely, I, re I mean, we had, my designer and I had, we had moose jokes and sort of silly physical comedy stuff that works really well um, with music, but I had been to a couple of performances there with, where the audience was extremely serious and incredibly kind of direct and, uh, and, and humorless and uh, I was thinking oh my god this is they're gonna just hate us um, but they did get us they thought we were very Monty Python 
<laughs> okay. Um, and so and so now I'm going to go and do another one there, and I th think, okay, they like the Australian sense of humour, so that's that's good. Um, so I think I do try and look at, at context and, and what connects us rather than what sets us apart. That's the first thing. And I think... Um, uh, my, as you, you noted, my job before before Upper Queensland, which is a very particular project, was directing um, Sydney Festival and before that Perth Festival. Um, and I think that's really again, you look at the city, you look at the at the audience, you look, at, you try and get a sense of keeping an ear to the ground and and a, a real sense of walking walking the streets and getting a sense of what people are talking about and trying to understand the people and then. Um, you know, it's just subliminally take that stuff in and, and develop work that you think will respond to that place. So that I guess in that in the sense, not necessarily architecturally that place, but in terms of the people that you meet and the, the, the vibe you get off the street, yes, I make work for the place. And I wonder about the sort of, I think, a kind of cultural anxiety that still exists but in smaller places such as Brisbane. I mean, to have this very conversation about who are we, is that something that bigger cultural centres have, or is that a preoccupation of places like Brisbane? Oh, look, I mean, you know, New York doesn't need to have that conversation because it's got a fantastic kind of sense of sense of self and it's, there are multiple senses of self, of course. I think it happens everywhere, really, and I think it'd be really problematic if it didn't happen because it's what, what Brisbane is in, in 2015 is not what Brisbane is, was in 2005 or, or you know, it's, a, it's an evolution and I think it's really important that places like Goma are having these conversations now and will have them, you know, periodically because it, it, it changes. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a Sydney sider who's come to, to Brisbane um, for a very particular project to, to look at this, see how a, this 400-year-old art form might engage with the contemporary community of Queensland. And it's a really interesting um, um, project, but um, I hadn't been in Brisbane apart from... Um, coming here to direct one-off shows um, and seeing, the, uh, you know, shows or festivals or coming up for, for um, the uh, Asia-Pacific Triennial. Uh, and, God, Brisbane's changed. And, and I think it's great to explore what that means and how that's happened and where, what the implications of the changes of, uh, around this, this state. I think, it's, I think it is exciting and I don't think it necessarily represents an anxiety or a cringe. I think it's... I think we're always looking at, you know, who are we, what are we? I think that's important to us as a, as a creative community. There's an interesting Twitter comment that's come in uh, asking you to comment on the new casino development and this push perhaps to a kind of casino-centric tourism. I wonder if we think about that in the context of a bigger aesthetic of Queensland culture. Is there one? I mean, you're all from four very different disciplines. When Lindy mentions a sense of humour or a particular kind of humour in your opera production, Ben, I mean, is there a particular Queensland version of humour that's different from other parts of the country? Well, uh, well I mentioned before that sometimes I can detect the people who are ex-Queenslanders <laughs> in Sydney, not just by a distinctive accent that especially comes out when they're intoxicated, but also... Um, you know, there is a type of humour, There, I mean, how can I pin it down? There's definitely a vulgarity there that Queenslanders tend to flock towards. I find that, for instance, you know, I work in the media essentially and a lot of people who are Sydney-based journalistic serious talents, and I'm not going to name names, they have this public persona of being very serious, but if you get them aside, they are telling the most dark, messed up, hilariously <laughs> gross jokes. And I'm like, are you, are you from Queensland? And they always, always say yes. So I don't know what that definable quality is, but there's a little bit of wrong town humour there um, <laughs> that I especially quite like. Um, so yeah, there, there is that, yeah. I think. Michael, what about in terms of the, the visuals that come out of Queensland beyond just architecture? Is, do we have that humour? Somehow, is there a playfulness about the way we do visual culture? Mm. Uh, well, well, my tendency to sort of, you know, I think, I think Sydney and Melbourne, if I can say one thing, still think we're a backwater to a degree. Mm. Um, and to a degree, I think that's to our advantage. Um, as I said, I think stylistically in Melbourne particularly, 
Um, there is a, a lot of diversity, but you're, you're a school of kind of outlandishness for the sake of it. Um, I don't think we do that here. I actually do think we think about solving what, what it is that we've, we've been confronted with and then trying to imagine the experience people might have of it. And um, we, we did, I did a, um, a conference a few years ago, which was the main architectural conference for, for Australia, and it was just called Experience, which and the reason I'm saying that to you is that I think we think about experience more than other cities that think visually primarily and we think about how do I use it, what do I touch, how do I feel, what I'm beside, more so than we think about, well, that's what it's going to be on mm -hmm. the postcard. Um, but I think from, an, from another degree, I was probably related to that, but I probably need to answer part of that, guys, that lady's question <laughs> something, in a minute. But, um, With the uh, casino. Yeah, but I think, um, I think it kind of relates because I still think dangerously that we're somewhere between it's still a big country town and a new world city. And if you believe the hubris, you know, the Lord Mayor says, new world city, science, arts, advancement, creativity. But I still think we're sort of somewhere mm. in there and don't quite know where we are there and therefore we can't define what, what, that, what that is. Um, the casino, to make a comment on it since it's been asked, I think is, is kind of um, epitomises that, that, that argument because apart from the morality of a casino, um, I think putting it, you know, across a quarter or a fifth or whatever of our entire CBD with something that's got a very singular thing about it, I find troubling. Um, and also I find it troubling that somehow we think entertainment is the culture of the future and that's all we need to be as a culture. Mm. We just entertain. Mm. Um, and it, you know, probably goes to the degree of are we a populist culture or is there something deeper um, that we're going to portray about ourselves. So I have a problem with that project, just to answer the question, to be kind of clear about it for that reason, that I would like to see um, us continue to be an experiential state and city about what people f feel and, and, and the emotive side of it, rather than a big splash city that puts great big things and destroys the grain of, of what we've got. It's almost like an argument across the river, isn't it? Because you've got Goma here, which is the most visited art gallery in Australia, possibly the Southern Hemisphere. The museum, and then you've got the museum, museum yeah. and, and you've got this whole cultural mm. complex that's used a yeah. lot. And then next to that, of course, you've got the ABC as well. And I love that that's positioned quite at the centre of things, that you've got a public broadcaster that's so central and visible and accessible. And then right opposite is going to be this new development, which sort of represents this other shadow side of Brisbane. I, I, I just find that yeah, duality yeah, very, interesting. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to say between country town and New York City. There are lots of these dualities that we're somewhere in between. Um, and I think if we we're a bit more sort of confident about what we were, we would be make, able to make those decisions more prudently than we're, we're perhaps making through opportunity. And to take that, the casino site, for instance, uh, I might have almost been inadvertently responsible because we did a study for the government on the office buildings that are all in that precinct that proved a lot of them were redundant and very under, underdeveloped. And so I'm someone's sure going to come and throw someone a went, coffee oh, on wacko. you <laughs> after this now. Well, maybe, but um, I'm saying what I think about it now, and um, I, I certainly didn't expect it. that would all get replaced by what kind of a singular one thing. I don't want us to get too derailed into this, but mm. uh, what would be, in your dream world, what sort of building could have been there instead? What's an imaginary um, alternative? Ma many buildings, but we, we did think that... Um, things like going to New World cities, museums, well, it is the most visited museum um, in Australia, which is was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Our museum is, a, is about a quarter of the size of another, uh, another state's museum of equivalent status, or even if you think internationally. So we think it should grow three to four times the size. It should already be at that if it's going to be a museum. So then, with, as you know, in many cities, they break up their science and technology museum from their natural history museum. We're a city that wants to project our sciences forward. So I thought it was a good thing perhaps to split the museum and do present our scientific advancements and our, our biosciences with a, a, a museum about that. And I thought that could go into the city on, on that site and that would be a far more activating thing than perhaps the casino is. Um, but also it would fit on our site and the streets would still be there around it and you'd still have the grain. But I do think we've removed a lot of culture from our city. The theatres have been taken out, they've been brought to the fringes. You know, Powerhouse is great, cultural precinct's great, and so on. But everything that was a cultural facility, the Suncorp Theatre and so on, Festival Theatre, Hall Theatre, all been taken out. There's no actual cultural element in the CBD anymore. Yet people come to it, so I wanted to bring that back. <coughs> 
Michael Zavros, I'd like to talk about the works that you've got in this exhibition in Goma Q. Are they particularly Queensland paintings <laughs> or photographs? Um, no, I, I don't think they are. Um, I, I think that my work is not um, particularly Australian. I don't think I make anything that resembles an Australian history or, 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 or an Australian culture. And, um, Insofar as I, I sometimes think of myself as very un-Australian, I think it's a very typical Australian story as well. I mean, I, I make work that's in some ways connected to a heritage that is not Australian, um, and, and uh, uh, with an eye to Europe or to, to places elsewhere. But I think that that can somehow be a very Australian story. The, the, the work that I have in Go McHugh, I suppose, is um, you know, speaking of identity which is what the show addresses and what we're talking about tonight, I, it, it's very connected to identity, I suppose, for me, because it contains a, a self-portrait and uh, some, a photograph of, of my, two of my daughters and, and a painting of one of them. So but one of the, the, the big painting <coughs> in this exhibition, Bad Dad, which mm -hmm. was uh, Archibald Finest, yeah. is that right? So it's, um, it seems to me in some ways a very Queensland painting. Could you talk <laughs> about it it's, a it's little bit? It's very Queensland in so far as I think we probably shot that in winter in, in our pool. Um, <laughs> so, so it's um, climactically, yes, it's, it's very Queensland and, and that very bright, um, harsh uh, light that we, that we get up here. And, um, it's um, it, it's a work that, like so much of my work, sort of pays reference to my heritage, but sort of within um, th through the lens of, of a kind of cultural narcissism um, and a kind of um, parental guilt, I suppose. So, um, if people haven't seen it, just explain yeah. what so the it's, painting it's, it's looks a, like. It's quite, it's quite a large uh, painting. It, it looks very realistic, almost like like a photograph. It's it's very bright, as you suggested, and. Um, it's, it's a painting of me in the pool, and I'm on a, a great big inflatable bunny pool toy, and I'm, I'm looking at, at my reflection, gazing, uh, gazing at myself in, in the pool, and there there are some sort of uh, very brightly coloured pool toys scattered around me. And the bad dad title, is that those children are absent? Or? Yeah, there, there is, there's kind of a, uh, an absence, I guess, suggested by the, 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 the playful... Uh, it's, a bit, it's, it's inspired, um, obviously it's, it's a Narcissus reference, but it's inspired by Caravaggio's very famous, very beautiful painting um, that I had seen just, just prior to, to making that work. Well, I think it's very Australian to take a Caravaggio and set it in a pool with inflatable <laughs> yeah. pool yes. toys. I think so. if, even, Michael, if you feel that your work is connected perhaps with European traditions, mm -hmm. when you see the other artists that are on show in Goma Q, and it's a very um, sort of loose, open gathering, it's not mm -hmm. artists aren't grouped thematically just by the fact of geography that you're all Queensland artists yes. or working in Queensland, do you see connections across the work with other artists or do you see yourself as kind of operating within your own sphere? Um, a little of both, I, I think. Um, I, I, f I feel that I'm very much operating in a, in a vacuum, um, a, a self-imposed vacuum, and I don't mean Queensland itself. I mean, I, we, we live you know, half an hour from, from here and I'm, I'm, I'm on this, this property um, you know, spending long hours by myself making my work, so there's kind of this self-imposed vacuum. And, um, I, I guess what, what connects my work to the other artists in the show is that I don't, I don't see a, typically, a, a typical Queensland aesthetic or, or Queensland concerns. I think that the artists in this, this show, or contemporary artists generally, um, make work for and, and are inspired by a, a, a global audience now. I think these, mm. these kids are all on this interweb thing and that they're, they're all, <laughs> I, I think that the, the new gallery is, is, is not a local one anymore and I think that the, 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 the concerns of artists are, are, are quite, quite global. I think that so much of what I see in Goma Q, um, you could find anywhere in, in the world. The, the way the artists have made the work, the concerns that the artists have. Um, wh whether you like the work or not, I think that it's it's not it's not particularly qu Queensland, except where it's referencing local politics or, or, mm. or, a, or a specific event. Well, let's talk a little bit more about audiences because I think in terms of understanding ourselves as a state, it's not just the people making the culture, but the people mm. who are engaging with it is important in in trying to nut out this question of uh, who are we a little bit. Linda, you talked you gave the example of of taking Huma to the Good Citizens of Leipzig. 
What about the audiences here in Queensland? Has your engagement with Opera Queensland, how has that evolved over the time that you've been in the role with Opera Queensland? Um, well, we are Opera Queensland, we're not Opera Brisbane. So the very, the, almost the, I, I, am, I live part-time in, in regional Australia and um, in New South Wales. Um, but, uh, and so I'm absolutely, I'm really passionate. I love living in in the country, and I, <clears throat> I love uh, I love regional audiences. Always have, always loved um, the the connection and the the enthusiasm and the kind of open heartedness and open mindedness of um, of regional communities. Um, <clears throat> so that when when I was um, invited to to take on the job, the, the the regional engagement in this m incredible state with these extraordinary landscapes and the wildness and the and the kind of kookiness of of all of the d d incredibly d different regional um, uh, centres from the Gold Coast, which I absolutely love. I love the Gold Coast and we've had some fantastic nights there with, with Opera Queensland to places like Mount, Mount Isa and um, t we, were in, we're in, um, air, we were in air last night and um, tonight we're in somewhere really, um, I'll, I'll think of it, the, the name of it, so in, a, in a riverbed doing a performance. So we we're all over the state and we we're, and you know, great, great towns like Toowoomba with their, with their magnificent Empire, Empire Theatre. Um, I think um, half. I, I think much of the opera company's future is is being in regional across regional Queensland and really engaging with those communities on their own terms and really engaging with the creativity within those communities. And that t is thrilling to me to actually have that. To me, is a is a really new age opera company that is not just this kind of you know uh, here's here's what you a version of what you might like to see at the Met or in Berlin or in London but this is the company that really en engages with you and talks to to uh, you you uh, in a different way because you are very different and um, in fact asks the community to participate in those performances. So tell us about Project Puccini which has <laughs> been a great example. Well it's of been this. extraordinary actually participation and uh, has been a, has been something that w I've been involved with as a, as a festival director people love and, and all of you guys know this too people love to participate they're not um, people aren't passive viewers anymore they're, they're participants they're, they're critics they're, they're, the, the, the exchange is very much two way I mean here we are with all of this going on um, <laughs> Uh, uh, which is great, but uh, so now uh, what we've what we've tried to do w is is turn the whole idea of regional touring on it on its head, and not just fly in and fly out and say, "Aren't we marvelous? We're Opera Queensland, and we're going to show you how it's all done." We basically um, last year, I'm sure this is a well-worn story, but we we auditioned 800 people across the state and developed eight commute choruses of 36 adults and 12 kids uh, for for a new production of um, Puccini's La Boheme. And it it went completely crazy. We we had um, doubled the, we doubled the audience, but the but the engagement from those audiences that, that were full all around this, the the state were, you know, we we played to, to fifteen hundred people in Mount Isa in one day, mm. uh, you know, amazing. Uh, uh, Puccini's La Boheme in Italian to fifteen hundred people in Mount Isa it was an extraordinary thing. So yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And so, I mean, look, it's, um, it, it, that was an extraordinary thing, but what that did was say, say that's the Greenfield site for opera of the future. And, and so it, it's taking those, um, those, those audiences and, their, and all of their um, particularity, um, you know, and really, really building that, over, over that relationship over, over time. And um, next year, in fact, we're, we're doing another one, uh, which, will, uh, which is a production that, uh, I can't name the, name the opera, but we will be creating another production that we'll take to all of those centres, in fact, more centres, because more want to be involved. And the production then, then goes to uh, uh, America. It's a co-production with us, ourselves and Seattle Opera and New Zealand Opera. And so it's, it goes literally from Mount Isa to Seattle, which is really <laughs> exciting. But it's interesting. I mean, is there a sort of tension between the globalised audience that Michael was talking about and the fact that you can take a production from Mount Isa to Seattle, but also it's all about context and local? Yeah. I mean, how do you juggle slightly as a different, director? It's, it's a slightly different um, art form. Obviously, Michael's work is, is the work is, is created. It's it's positioned and it's placed in a in a in a gallery context. Ours is a time-based art form. We spend time developing the work um, with the community, 
who's whether it's in Brisbane or in in um, in New Zealand or in in Seattle or in in Townsville, uh, we spend time with that community developing that that work. So we there is an exchange that is much more face to face. Um, the 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 community gets to sing with the, the singers from our company and from. Um, and, and musicians from Queensland Symphony Orchestra and works with a conductor. So it's a much, it's a very m much more meaningful exchange, a much more kind of visceral exchange. And they're exchanging stuff that's not necessarily to do with the art. It's exchanging life stories and lifts home and that sort of thing. Um, and and uh, that becomes something that's much more of a, um, I guess, a community. And I'm very passionately involved with or you know passionate about community and and what that all means but also the notion of adventure and adventure being something that so I think you mentioned the notion of adventure before I love that that sense and that's when I when when I think of Queensland I think I do think adventure <laughs> in lots of lots of different kinds of adventures Ben, how do you understand your audience I mean do you think about who's reading you who's watching you is it some specific target group? Well, I guess the simple answer to that question is it depends on the publication I'm writing for. And although I used to have a column in Q Weekend that came out with the Courier Mail, shortly after I moved to Sydney, um, you know, Fairfax Sydney bought me, so then I betrayed us and, and I took my column over to the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. So I do get a much firmer sense that even though that column syndicated in the Brisbane Times, that my editor is very much focused on those Sydney and Melbourne readers first and foremost. But I also guess, I guess I also position myself as a particularly Queensland, Sunshine Coast slash Brisbane voice as well. And I think like for a long time, especially when... Um, so someone saying they're contributing to, to go talks from my bed in a small English, that English country it's town. Fantastic. That's the See, good side go. of globalisation. They're, yeah. not, they're not wearing any clothes either. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what are you wearing? They're, they're going to join us by Which video Which is very Queensland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was I saying? I'm just imagining someone well, naked but, now. Um, but well, one thing that I think is that you've pointed out is that to think about identity as state-based, but we're all overlapping identities and us white heterosexuals can forget that. Yeah, and, and to an extent, I mean, like, there was this period, um, especially after Kevin Rudd got, got um, elected as Prime Minister, uh, where the whole nation's eyes were on Queensland. They were just like, he's from Queensland. What, <laughs> what's that about? They thought it was the most craziest notion because in the sort of imagination of Australians, adventure, yes, mm. sort of this frontier landscape, and sort of a little bit not quite right in the head. That's what they think of us. And, um, you know, you, you do get that impression that... I mean, my boyfriend and I were having this conversation the other night where we were saying Sydney and Melbourne are self-obsessed. And that's not a bad thing, but they are, they are, they are thinking about what, what, what is Sydney, blah, blah, blah. Like, they're very confident in themselves and they're competing against each other because they're Australia's first and second siblings, right? And then the third sibling, Brisbane, is sort of sort of left to his or her own devices and as a result can sometimes feel self-conscious as well. Like this sort of discussion about our identity, um, our voice, our persona, isn't something that's really done in the South. You know, th they seem quite, quite almost bolshy about who they, who they are. Um, and as a result, I kind of like getting back to like audience and stuff like that. I kind of like that I can get away with a bit more because they know that I'm a Queenslander. Like, my, my humour can be, be a bit grosser, and it's like, well, I've got an excuse. Um, <laughs> and, and it is sort of this... It's kind of Australia-concentrated, right? And when you've got my background, which is Chinese, and you plonk it into uh, pretty much a monoculture, which is the Sunshine Coast, and I did check the ABS stats, and it's pretty white. Um, they, that, that sort of sense of an outsider in this sort of strange landscape, that's kind of the voice that I talk in and with. 
And, and the sense of being an outsider, I mean, I think there's a line from Dame Edna Everidge that Australia is the Tasmania <laughs> of the no, world. No, no, Australia is the Brisbane of the world. Australia is the Brisbane. I've, see, I've transformed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've world. just totally, you've roped in <laughs> poor Tasmania <laughs> into this <laughs> as well. <laughs> I did live in Hobart for a year and that's probably coming out. <laughs> Australia is the Brisbane of the world, which is yeah. such a, a fabulous line. And I mean, I think you can, can argue the merits or not of that. But if we do accept uh, as a given that we are on the outside, side of a certain international continuum of art and culture we are. I mean, but that's we're, why we're people, are, people are always so surprised that Brisbane and by extension Queensland is fantastic mm. because especially if you're from New South Wales or Victoria, people who visit Queensland are just like, wow, Brisbane's actually beautiful, wow, your culture is actually amazing and so are your cultural facilities. Like, they, they, they're stunned by it and it's like, how do you not know mm. about that? And then I think the great thing is when Goma might have, like I remember the Valentino exhi exhibition was so big around the country and I just drew everyone in. Similarly, the Andy Warhol exhibition, when people come here, then they realise, oh, this is, this is here, I'd like to come here more. I don't know, it just doesn't seem on a lot of people's radar sometimes. And there is something liberating about being positioned as an outsider. For you, it's being able to make more vulgar humour. Yes, yes. Um, Michael Zavros, what about for you? I mean, in terms of being an, uh, working where you do outside of the, the world's main art centres, even Australia's key art centres, is that a freeing thing? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's, it's very necessary for me to be away from, away from it all and to have this, this, this vacuum that I was talking about to, to make my work. It, my work takes a long time to make and I, I, there's no way around those, those solitary hours that, that go into to the work and so it's very good to not have lots of distractions and, and, and in a completely other way I, I find it really beneficial to, um, to be away from the bigger art centres because I think so many, so many artists and I've seen friends and peers just become quite stifled by the art world um, over time and, and we have this assumption that artists um, should and, and really like to engage with the art world and go to everything and, and have this dialogue with each other. But I, I, don't, I don't know that it is always healthy for artists to, 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 to be a part of the art world um, as much as, as it is for their, for their work to be. And, and, and that's a happy place for me. So I, I feel like I can make this stuff and it can, it can leave me and, and join the art world. I don't really have to. And that's, that's much better f for me. Um, and I can make a more confident gesture because of that, because I'm in this, this studio where I don't have to think about <laughs> even an audience or anyone seeing what I do and, and until, it, until it does get on the truck and, and, <laughs> and I think that's a painting of me in the pool. Um, but, but while I'm in my studio, I don't have to think about anything. It's just this, this, um, it's this focus that's, that's quite a nice uh, space to be. It's can, I, can I ask Michael something? How much <laughs> of your success do you think is contingent on you actually being based? in Queensland and being able to work from this state as opposed to any other I state? Think, I think a lot of it. Um, it's, sometimes it's, it's a little bit that thing where you're maybe a little, little bit of a bigger fish in a smaller pond. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, it's that thing where um, <coughs> you can do something that is a little bit outside because you're not really sort of focused on, on what else is happening. When I was an emerging artist and I was first curated into shows in Sydney, I would, I would go down there for the opening and spend a few days down there and I would find artists, just assume that I was from, from Sydney. Um, or, or that if I was from Brisbane, they could name a gallery and just assume that I was maybe a, a part of that. But I, I have found it, um, th there are some benefits to, to being you know, outside of the, mm. that, that super competitive field. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting, William Robinson, who's such a different artist from you in terms mm -hmm. of that aesthetic, has said to me almost exactly the same thing, mm. that he loves working on his farm and has his whole career because it allows him to mm. work with his own tradition rather than feeling it's against the immediate milieu that he Absolutely. And, and he, he too is engaging with this thing that is thousands of years old and, um, and it's such a bizarre and romantic thing to be doing at a time when everyone else is doing important things that have meaning <laughs> and, 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 and are changing people's lives, you know, in, in a very formal way, you know, it's, it's nice to do. Um, Michael Rayner, I wonder also, obviously, and I think if we look at GOMA, what the Asia Pacific Triennial has mm. done right from mm. the start is make us question these categories of mm. insider, outsider and centre and periphery. It just sort of exploded that and it's like the rest of the world has mm. caught up to thinking actually there's some really exciting visual art happening here of a different mm. nature. 
Where should we be looking? I mean, maybe instead of looking south to Sydney mm. and Melbourne or mm. far north to Europe and the States, should we be looking near north, Oceania, I was Pacific? I thinking this as we were talking, um, particularly your Tasmanian comment. The poor <laughs> Sorry, buggers Tasmania. <laughs> stuck down the bottom no matter what, whereas um, <coughs> it's true. They have to look a, to Antarctica. We are between those southern states and um, the Asia-Pacific region. So I think something Lindy said before about, you know, and I'm just reading a comment there about it, is self-consciousness of our place and vernacular as much a weakness as a strength compared to more competent capitals that, that have been talked about. And that, I do think that's right. Melbourne and Sydney have a degree of self-satisfaction about what they, they do, and perhaps that's a weakness that we don't. But I think, as Lindy m mentioned, I don't think we need to keep... I like the fact that we talk about who we are and we worry about it and question it and we fight the state of origin and, and, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I'm happy for the discussion, but I think connectedness is probably the answer to me, is that um, I, the uh, uh, Asia-Pacific Triennial in, in film, in art, um, there's going to be one in architecture next year, I think. A um, little plug for that. Um, the, the more we kind of pull uh, that kind of work together and become a hub of talk and discussion, which is what we're doing tonight, um, within that whole region, the more our identity will come with that. And I don't mind if Singapore is also a hub or Seoul is also a hub. Mm. What I don't like is if we're not part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, and I reckon we can get our identity far away from Sydney and Melbourne <laughs> if we become a participant in that, mm. that broader um, cultural discussion. So I think you know that's, that's really the great potential for us. But I think it makes me think as an architect all sorts of things about Brisbane and Queensland. If you're going to be that and... Uh, you need to look like it. You need to be a connected city. Um, people talk about let's have a creative industries precinct and put all the creative industries in one place and we'll have that identity. We've got so many precincts. We've got dining precincts. Yeah, We've got I just think I'd rather see them all connected. And I mm -hmm. keep thinking years yeah. ago, even though it's a, one obvious part of saying that about pedestrian bridges, which we've done too, but the plan for me was you've got a river that looks like this and you want people that got to get, get across to all sorts of things. You can make these three great linear conduits of bridge links going across um, that river, that would be really identifiable. And then to me, instead of just putting things around willy-nilly, why don't we put them on those conduits so people see these conduits of cultural facilities coming through and then they get an identity from it. So to that extent, bringing it back to a very um, prosaic term, I'd like to think of the city as a canvas and a canvas of, of, of things that happen on it in a pattern that people can remember and go, oh, yeah, I know, that's what Brisbane's like. I get to go to all those things. That's the experiential city to me. Um, but I think we need to be that if we're going to portray to the world that we're a city wanting to connect mm -hmm. by showing that we're also connected, and that means digitally as much as it is, is physically. Um, so, you know, I reckon that's a huge opportunity for us. I do like the term New World City, even though you can say it's corny, but that's what it means. What do you like about it? I like that part about it, that it's saying we want to be part of the world. Not Tassie, um, you know, <laughs> uh, down there. So um, I like the fact that it actually says it and it, and it means you then do have to connect um, <laughs> with, with other places. And so I think our, today our, la our self-consciousness is, can be our strength in saying let's not just try and go, oh, we're Queensland, you know, let's, we're, we're great. Let's be part of a bigger, a bigger fa uh, fabric or a bigger uh, mosaic of places. It's that tricky um, balancing act, isn't it, if we all seem to be agreeing that one of the defining characteristics of a Queensland culture is a, a humour, a lack of taking ourselves culturally too seriously, but also wanting to make a statement about culture and about our future mm. that is serious, how to do mm. both at the same time. I, I was thinking before, and I think we just talked outside, we, we did win a competition in China in Tianjin for the National Maritime Museum of China, <laughs> And I knew that if people in Australia were going, how did you win that from Queensland? Um, and that was a really sort of weird feeling because I just think we do our work and we're, mm. we're an architect and there's other architects and anyone could win it. But the fact that people kind of thought that... Uh, actually, I felt really great, the fact they thought <laughs> that. Um, but, you know, deep down, yeah. Um, <laughs> whatever. But uh, the other part about that is, I was mentioning, we, we won it because every city in the world, tr is, well, many cities in the world are trying to brand themselves culturally by a thing, you know, it was an object, an icon. Let's have an icon for Brisbane. Well, haven't we got an icon yet? Where's our opera house or, mm. or whatever? Um, and I don't think that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to sort of rail against. We won that competition because we're the only firm that didn't do that. We actually did a museum of five linked museums, which is the connected part of it, 
didn't, didn't have a massive presence, but I reckon they'll get a lot more identity out of the fact they've done that than built yet another object. And China has got 100 museums in happening in 100 cities. They're all, if they're all icon objects to, you know, and stars, they're, they're going to get lost. So we're doing um, something completely different. But my point is that's how we won it from Brisbane because that's the way we think in Queensland about um, places that are mentioned before about being experienced more than they are being about sort of just visual gratification. When you say we don't have an icon, you're obviously forgetting the um, Eiffel Tower at Park Road. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is That's the defining uh, I, item. I, I of all the things that you could think of. Or <laughs> well, the step and needle. Or the step and needle, step exactly, and needle. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And Ben, I mean, there are ways that Queensland artists are leaders. I mean, tell us a bit more about the filming of The Family Law, because it's a very different yeah. kind of TV series than we've seen on so, Australian um, TV. So, Screen Australia funded three Queensland-based projects in its last round of TV projects that were going to be made. Um, the second series of The Code on ABC is one of them. The Family Law, which is going to be on SBS, is another one of them. And I think that's really great. And I think within the television industry in Australia, uh, an industry to which I'm quite new, there is a growing consciousness and awareness that there should be stories being told from this state as well. I know that growing up, very rarely do you see representations of this state outside of um, surf, sand and bikinis. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm fans of all three. Um, but but we're, we're positioning our show very much in this sort of coastal suburbia, which is the kind of Queensland that I grew up with. And it's also <laughs> Asians in coastal suburbia as well. You know, Pauline Hanson's predictions came right. Um, and, <laughs> and I never, I mean, there are a few things going on here, which is why I'm quite happy that this production is going ahead. Um, one, just as a Chinese Asian Australian, very rarely saw people like myself on screen, and this is a show that's going to have 90% Asian Australian cast, 10 out of, uh, one out of 10 Australians identify as having strong Asian heritage, and we don't really see cultural diversity on screen, so that's the first point. And the second point is the Queensland thing as well, just having a show that's just incidentally set here, but could kind of be mm. anywhere, but very much specifically situated in that sticky, hot Queensland summer that you feel whether you're in Brisbane or in the coast or in the hinterlands, you feel that sort of mugginess and we've tried to capture that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the reference to funding, I mean, there's a whole question that we haven't had time for around what the government role and what sort of public policy role in art and culture is. We'd have had a very interesting discussion a couple of years ago, wouldn't we? <laughs> we would have, a, a, an ongoing one, I think. I mean, it is interesting that we have a, a Premier now who's also the Arts Minister. I mean, that's a symbolic statement, if nothing else, and how that's actually affecting things on the ground is an interesting one. But given, someone has mentioned that our, our icon is the big pineapple. <laughs> well, I think that got which, closed out. Yeah, as, which is still there, yeah. but isn't, isn't being used. As has Clive Palmer's um, dinosaur world. Oh, wasn't, wasn't, was there a fire? Is that there what happened a, to the fire. dinosaurs? Now, yeah. that'd be a good subject for you. <laughs> yes, like, next time staring into a dinosaur. <laughs> okay. Or Clive on a dinosaur. I think you could, only you could make that beautiful. Um, I, I think, though, that we should finish, we should finish with a group fantasy. I think that's how every Goma talks oh. should finish. <laughs> and given that I think the idea from Goma is that this Goma Q Contemporary <coughs> Queensland exhibition will be held regularly, so we'll probably be reconvened, all of us, in, you know, 20 years' time or so. Let's just imagine what would we like to be the state that we are living in, in, say, 2035, in our ideal state. What are the characteristics of the art and culture here? Oh, Lindy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, look, I, I'm just fascinated by, by Michael's... Um, canvas thing. I, I, I w w spent a lot of time when I was festival director thinking what is a festival and then what what are the performing arts and that for me it's this sense of, of being a meeting place and the same thing uh, here with these cultural precincts. So I think that I would like to see um, in terms of policy but also just in terms of a way of thinking a much more joined up, more connected, a sense of, the, of um, meeting places uh, but what kind of cultural meeting places would we create and those being very, uh, very 
particularly Queensland. So still that lovely informality, the sense of connection with the, 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 the climate and that stickiness you're talking about, that relaxed, you know, ha hanging around in your, in your shorts, that kind mm. of idea, but also that wonderful, you know, we, are, we do have that fantastic kind of sort of sense of brashness and, and, and vulgarity, but also the quirkiness, the, the kind of darkness of the, the, the Kransky sisters, for example, you know. So that, that kind, those kinds of elements that we, are that the celebratory uh, elements of the distinctiveness of Queensland being our meeting places, not ne necessarily meaning that we have to disconnect with the rest of the world, but, but bringing in, but just really looking at, again, it's who we are and, and what kind of meeting places do we want to create and let's have those and invite the world to them. Hmm. Michael Zavros, what do you think from I your think, studio? I think connection is, is a really good one. I, I think of Queensland and the, these wonderful centres being actually quite spread out. But the regional sector in the visual arts is is so rich and thriving, and um, I think that we could be maybe a little more co collegiate and be a little more connected, um, and embrace those really amazing things that are happening in in regional Queensland. Um, in terms of of Go McHugh and and that and that continuing, I think that's a wonderful thing. But I, I like the idea of. Uh, artists showing, especially in this museum, you know, our, our big star attraction, not under the banner of, 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 of a Queensland show. And I think that's something that I don't know that we've done especially well, but, but are starting to, and that is to em embrace, embrace our stars and make stars out of, out of the wonderful things that are happening in this state, and to not look further afield. Now, I, I wouldn't drive a, um, a, a parochial agenda at, at all. I don't think we need to, but I think we do need to embrace the really wonderful things that are happening in Queensland. And see um, those artists in a context not only of Queensland, but a different context absolutely. as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then I think maybe we won't be asking these sorts of questions, which are very good questions to ask, but I think without the anxiety and without the, without asking these questions through the lens of a comparison to other mm. centres. Michael Rayner, in, in 2035, are you still working with Green Glass? What's yeah. happening? <laughs> no, I, I told you I'd done that when he was six. It's never happened again. <laughs> um, I, I think, firstly, I'd like, I'm happy to be an Australian city. I really would like to be an Asian Pacific city. And, mm. but, um, and I don't mind what the others do, whether they want to do that too, and we want to become a country like that. But I want, I'd like our city and state to be seen seamlessly as part of that bigger realm. Um, you mentioned something before which I forgot to answer which was about blurring inside and outside and it just relates to another part of that question. We, we, get, we got recognised a while ago as we work with artists um, and it seems like an oddity, you know, you're an odd per firm that you, you do work with artists um, and that partly came out of the public art program and I'm not a great lover of public art as in plonk stuff around but I reckon there's a great uh, benefit in uh, bringing architects uh, in with artists, with performance art, with digital, mm -hmm. digital art and technologies all together to create the kind of built environments that, you know, say about blurring, but that do open out and engage a public realm and don't have edges to those buildings. And you mentioned Goma, but in a way it actually is an edged building. Um, I'd like to see all the buildings breathe out and then that, by doing that, it creates the canvas, if I can say, for all sorts of artistic activity and performance uh, things to happen around the edges, including our own cultural precinct here. Um, here, which is, as you know, quite strong, solid boxes. Um, I reckon that could be a vastly different uh, city and urban environment than anyone else will create in Australia if we were able to do that. But it'll only work if we actually get our artists and our architects and others that kind of see each other as different animals. Um, coming, coming together and working together, not adding to it, just being an additive thing. I love that architects think of things as being an edged building. <coughs> I would have thought all buildings are edged buildings. Yeah, um, <laughs> they are, but there's actually no reason for it. We only need an umbrella to get the rain and the sun off our heads and the rest of it can happen without the edges. Okay, that's what we're going to be doing in 20 years, <laughs> all with an umbrella. Ben, will you be moving back in 20 years' time? What would have to be happening for that? Nothing. I could eat. I could move back any time, and I'm quite happy to as well. Every time I'm back here, I'm very happy to be here. Um, the, the, the one thing that I'd really like to see the same, actually, going into our future is, at least within the arts world, and I feel this within the writing world, um, is the 
collegiate nature between artists. There's this almost vacuum of competitiveness and because maybe that's to do with the heat, we can't build up the aggression, maybe that's <laughs> to do with the fact that we're in this together as well and I know that for a long time in Queensland, when I was developing as a writer, my friends weren't just the non-fiction writers like me, but they were the horror writers or the journalists and the romance writers and the poets because we all shared that sort of one thing but we weren't each other. And I feel like within that environment, that's how I felt I could grow. So I love that about Queensland and Brisbane and it's not something that you find in many other big cities. Um, and then I think the second thing is I really agree with Lindy. I really like when Queensland and Brisbane doesn't set itself, um, you know, in op it doesn't compare itself. It's like one of the questions earlier today was what would need to happen for Brisbane to be viewed culturally the same as Sydney and Melbourne? And I actually think that would be a horrible yeah, thing horrible. if that happened. No. I don't want to be the same no. as Sydney and Melbourne. I want us to be distinct and different. Like we are this capital city in Australia that has like the climate of Southeast Asia and the Pacific and we've got the biological diversity of like the Jurassic era like I was recently in the Daintree and it's insane like it's basically Jurassic Park have you seen a cassowary they're bizarre <laughs> and and in all of that that wildness we've got this distinct image and brand that we should really protect and foster and aggressively promote and celebrate and celebrate oh, I think that's an excellent place to end please join me in thanking my guests And to let you know that we will be broadcasting this conversation nationwide on Books and Arts on ABC RN this Saturday at 2 o'clock. And it's then available on our website if you want to pass it on maybe to, to guests in friends in southern states or foreign climes. Um, <laughs> and tonight's GOMA Talks is the first of two events that's been co-presented between RN and GOMA during the GOMA Q exhibition. Next Thursday, my colleague Paul Barclay from RN's Big Ideas is going to be exploring what shapes us. That's going to be looking more at public discourse in Queensland. So it could be an interesting comparison to the conversation that's happened here tonight. I'm Sarah Konoski. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>